Well, a person's disposition is their mood or general attitude about life, right? Like you talk about some folks have a cheery disposition, other folks have a grumpy disposition, some people might be uh, timid, <clears throat> that's their disposition, some people are outgoing, <laughs> and the older I get, the more I can relate to the grumpy old men who came before me. <laughs> I mean, you can ask my kids, dad just kind of grumbles about a lot, that's kind of what I sound like, uh, kind of like Harry from, uh, you know, Home Alone, uh, you know, he, he grumbles a lot, <laughs> you know, turn out the lights, pick up your shoes, clean up your room, turn that TV down, all that fun stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess, you know, your dispositions change as you get a little bit older, but I think all of us have a, a default disposition, and we, uh, you know, approach life in different ways. And what I want to do today is I want to think through the lens of disposition when it comes to the gospel and Jesus. And as we begin to dig into chapter 25, we're going to see that there essentially are three groups of people. We're going to look at the Jews and their disposition toward Jesus and the gospel. We're going to look at Paul and his disposition. And then we're going to look at this guy named Festus, who we'll learn more about here in a moment, and his disposition toward Jesus and the gospel. So what I would like to do as we dive in is I want to look at three things. I want to look at, number one, being contrary to Christ. So there's a fun word for you. Number two, courageous for Christ. Then number three, confused about Christ. So that's our three headings today. So let's look at that first one, contrary to Christ. Now to be contrary is to be opposite of something. And you know, you don't normally hear that, that vocabulary used much today, like that person's contrary. Uh, I remember uh, my grandfather calling people contrarians before to, <laughs> to describe people who are difficult to work with. Um, but as we're going to see in these first seven verses, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, these guys that made up the Sanhedrin, they were a mixture of Pharisees and Sadducees, if you remember. That's kind of the ruling parties that were in charge there. They continue to show their true colors. They are contrary to Christ and the gospel is what we're going to see here. So let's look at verse 1. It starts out, Festus then, having arrived in the province three days later, went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Now let's pause here for a second. Who is Festus? Now if you're like me, you can't help but think of Festus Hagen. It's Marshal Matt Dillon's right-hand man in Dodge City. But this is not Gunsmoke. This is Caesarea. And uh, it's been two years, two years since the end of the last chapter. Sometimes we can buzz through chapters of the Bible and not stop to think about the time that elapses between verses even. And so we have two years of Paul being in custody there in Caesarea. And we don't know much about Portius Festus outside of what Luke records for us here in the book of Acts. We know that he was sent by Nero to replace Felix. So if you remember, Claudius was the emperor when Felix was installed in power. We talked about that last week. Now we have Nero who started out strong but ended very, very poorly and uh, hated Christians. Uh, but, but we see Festus was reportedly much more competent in leading and politicking than Felix was. So he was a much better leader. He seems to be much more level-headed. And also we know his time of service was short because he died after about two years in office. That's all we really know about this guy. But in contrast to Felix and his ambivalence that we talked about last week, how Felix was just, you know, uh, you know ambivalent toward everything. He was only worried about himself. Um, we see that Festus hits the ground running. It's almost like he knows that he's got a job to do, and he is, he is there to impress his employer, which is the emperor of Rome, Nero himself. So he quickly arranges a meeting with the Jewish leaders because he knows that he needs them on his side. He knows that he has to have them uh, in good standing with him so that he can, uh, you know, have peace.
peace as he begins his, his governorship there. He knows that he needs to win them over if he is to put a stop to the turmoil in his jurisdiction, which is for Rome, they're, they're fine with you as long as you comply, pay your taxes, keep things quiet. If you do those things, you can get along well with, with the Roman Empire. But that was never the case. And much as we see today there in Jerusalem, things are still always tumultuous. So we see that, you know, that's very much the same thing back then. We, we have turmoil going on there. So Festus shows that he is a politician at heart. He knows how to lead. He's ready to make alliances that will benefit him, make his job easier. So let's look at verse 2. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul, that he might have him brought to Jerusalem. And then in my Bible, it's gotten in parentheses, at the same time, setting an ambush to kill him on the way. So here we go again, plotting and scheming to kill Paul. So these guys show very clearly that their motto must have been, if at first you don't succeed, continue to try stupid things again. Because that is what they're trying to do here. It did not work out for them last time, and it's not going to work out for them this time, because God is sovereign and in control, and he's going to use a pagan governor to protect Paul once again. But do you see the deep-seated hatred here? These guys are just seething, the hatred that they have. The Jewish leaders are not going to let this go with Paul. They have held on to it for this long, and they want to see him dead. They hate him. They hate everything that he proclaims. They are contrary to the gospel. So verse 4, Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. So Festus flexes on the Jewish leaders here. He's like, hey, listen, I'm in charge. We're going to go down to my house to have this settled. All right, we're not going to bring him here. He makes it known that Paul is secure in Rome's custody, and he likely knew what was up. He knew the back channels. He had communication on the ground, I'm sure. He was most likely briefed about this situation and knew that they had it out for Paul. They had tried to assassinate him once before. They had to use a, you know, a garrison of 200 troops to protect him the first time he was transported. They're not about to let Paul leave Caesarea. It's just not beneficial to keeping the peace there. So verse 6, after he had spent not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea And on the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. So Festus hangs out with the leaders there in Jerusalem for a week or so. He rubs shoulders with them, gets to know them, brings them back with him to his home base in Caesarea, where they are going to drag Paul once again before them to reprise the same old song and dance from two years prior. So here's Paul getting another chance to make a defense of the gospel. Verse 7, after Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. So imagine this scene with me. It's like a swarm of hyenas. I don't know if that's what you call a group of hyenas. I don't know if it's a swarm or not. Uh, I was wondering that on the way here. I'm like, what do you call a group of hyenas? Trouble is what I would call that. And so they're circling around like a wounded animal. So think about that for a moment if you've ever watched like National Geographic. I mean, that's, that's what we see here. Do you see that? I mean, here's Paul standing defenseless yet again before another Roman leader. He doesn't have representation. He doesn't have a public defender. He's got himself and he's got the advocate of advocates, Jesus, there with him. So he's standing there before another leader and here are the same usual suspects surrounding him almost like they're snarling, right? Like they're, they're just ready to pounce on him. It's like the group of bullies on the playground surrounding the kid that they want to see pounded, right? Like they, don't, they don't like Paul, and so it's almost like they're surrounding him and just ready to pounce upon him. But, but think about this for a moment. It's been two years. I know I've already said that, but that astounds me. Two years since all of this began, and they're still filled with just as much, if not more, hatred toward Paul. 
You get this idea that it's grown and festered since the last time they saw him, and they are consumed with literally killing this man, plotting, scheming, wanting to assassinate him. It's like it's all they can think about. They're obsessed with it. So friends, listen, I think there's a warning here. We have to be careful that you aren't consumed with hatred toward those who disagree with you. And it's real easy in this day and age to to go down those rabbit holes of hatred. The internet, social media, all of that makes it very, very easy to do. And as I've heard it put before, hatred is like acid. It can damage the container in which it is stored as well as destroy the object on which it is poured. And when Candace and I first got married, she was the only high school science teacher in Barberville, Kentucky. She was the entire science department, all right? Barberville had a student body of about 120 kids from kindergarten all the way through high school. Tiny, tiny Appalachian school district. And so she was part of the chemistry. Yeah, she taught chemistry there as well. And I remember we first got married and I went into her classroom and I had to help her organize. And there was some, like all these different chemicals on shelves in the closet in her classroom that had been there for years. And you're like, don't touch that container. It might explode, right? Like it might burn you. There's some, we don't even know what's in those containers right now because they were put there in 1972. So just leave them alone. So acid can destroy. But remember, it's not really Paul that they hate. We talked about that last week. If you, if you weren't here, we, we talked about how, yeah, they hate Paul. They do. I mean, they're consumed with hatred for him. But what they're really despising is Jesus, the gospel, the truth of the resurrection. That's who they hate. They hated him enough to crucify him. As a matter of fact, some of these guys might have been there casting the vote for Jesus to be crucified on the day that that happened. These guys hate the gospel. They hate everything about it. They hate the resurrection. They hate God's plan to bring salvation to the Gentiles. It doesn't jive with their outlook on life and how they see power in their hands. It disrupts it. They are contrary to everything about Jesus and the gospel. So let me ask you, is this you today? Are you contrary to the gospel? Do you hate Jesus? Do you hate his claims? You might be here today, somebody invited you, and you don't even know why you said yes. You might be listening later online, watching later online, and you might be somebody who's not a fan of Jesus. You're not a fan of the claims of Jesus, of what the Bible says. You really hate it. Are you contrary to the gospel? Or maybe this is more of where you fall. Are you contrary to what the gospel requires of you? Maybe you're not a fan of having to forgive others, a fan of showing grace to others, a fan of loving them as Christ has loved you. Maybe you don't like the idea of having to repent and lay down your life and turn to Jesus and hand everything over to him. Maybe you struggle with that in your life. You you might be like, man, I'm, I'm here at church. I don't hate the gospel. But maybe you struggle with certain aspects of what is required of you. So friends, listen. If you struggle with loving others, forgiving them, remember that those who have been loved much love much. You can't help but love. If you know Jesus today, you know perfect love. And it casts out all fear. It casts out all hatred. It casts out all the things that would make you contrary to him. And if you don't know Jesus today, if you stand opposed to him, my question to you is, why exactly? Why do you have that hatred in your heart? What has Jesus done to you specifically for you to hate him and hate his claims? Well, you don't know. You don't know, Brandon. You don't know what so-called Christians have done to me, how they've hurt me, how churches hurt me. Listen, I acknowledge those things. 
because they are very real. I acknowledge that certain folks who wave the banner of Jesus, sometimes the most loud ones, have done and continue to do stupid and hurtful things. That is very true. I never want to minimize what you have experienced because I have experienced hurt in the realm of church, in the realm of Christians. People who claim to know Jesus can be hurtful. They can be hateful. They can be hopeless even. But they're just people, friends. Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is loving and forgiving and gentle and stands ready to heal you today no matter what trauma has been inflicted upon your life. So don't let hateful, bitter people taint your view of the one who stands ready to transform your life today. Don't allow that to cloud who Jesus really is. Don't remain contrary to Christ because of what others have done in his name because that's not Jesus. You give him a chance and you will see that he is so much more than you can imagine. He is so much better than anything that you could conjure up in your mind and try to replace him with. So look to him today. Don't be contrary to Christ and his gospel. Instead, look to him and allow him to impact your heart. So we see those who are contrary to Christ. Secondly, we see those who are courageous for Christ. And namely, just one person in our passage here today. So here we see Paul speaking on his own behalf for the first time in two years. And he sticks to his guns. He's uh, not about to change his disposition toward the gospel. Look at verse 8. He says, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. So Paul is unwavering in his defense. I have done nothing wrong. I'm an innocent man. I'm innocent before the Jews, before the temple, before Caesar, and before God. I am blameless. Verse 9, but Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor. You see that? Here we go. Politicians got a politic, right? I mean, he's only been there a few days, but Festus is ready to start handing out favors to make his life easier. So he answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? So he's basically saying, ah, a compromise I offer you. Uh, It seems reasonable and friendly enough, right? Like, I will go to Jerusalem with you and we'll have the trial there. And Paul's not about to have it. Paul says, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. (laughs) He's like, listen, they're the ones that brought all this mess up in the first place. I am on trial before you. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. So he's saying, listen, Festus, I know you just showed up, but you know this full story. You know what's going on here. Verse 11, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. Man, what a bold, courageous statement. There's Paul standing there. He's ready to go to the mat in this match, right? He's like, listen, I've got the Lord Jesus on my side. I am standing tall and strong in him. Look, I am where I am supposed to be. This is where God has called me to be, and I'm going to stand here courageously for the gospel. I'm not afraid of death should that come, but these guys and their charges are bogus, So he shows that he is courageous. He is trusting in the Lord. And he goes on to say here, but if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Here's a big deal. That is a big, bold statement on Paul's behalf. But do you see the wisdom here? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. A lot of these passages flow together and have very similar themes. So it's kind of difficult from week to week to pick out something new and different. But but sometimes, you know, God repeats things and shows us things over and over so that we will understand them, so that they will penetrate our heart. We talked about this back in chapter 23. Paul knows his rights and he's wise in how he applies them. He does Uh, He does apply them in wisdom. He knows it's against Roman law to condemn somebody who is innocent. I mean, he knows that that is a part of the makeup of the judicial system. He knows that Jesus 
has promised him that he will declare the gospel in Rome. Remember that? Jesus came and stood next to him after that first trial, literally stood next to him and said, good job. You have testified about me here. You will testify about me in Rome. So he knows that he's got this calling to go there. So he does what is within his legal right to do. He appeals to Caesar. Now there's questions of like, well, if Paul could have done this, why did he not do that two years beforehand? I think it's because he knew that Jesus was calling him to Rome, but he knew that he still had a ministry where he was. Because remember, Felix kind of kept bringing him back over and over again, hearing the gospel over and over again. And I'm sure that Paul had other people who were there in the Roman, uh, you know, citadel where he was that he was witnessing to. We know that he used to do those things because he says in Philippians that what has happened to him has actually happened to, to him to further the gospel. He is in chains. He is arrested, but he is able to witness to people and share the hope of Jesus with them, people that he would never come into contact with otherwise had he not been where he was. And he was a man of prayer, and I'm sure that he knew in his heart when it was go time, when it was time to lay down this card that would get him to Rome. And I think that he's human as well. He was probably hoping he could get to Rome without the chains, <laughs> without being arrested. He was just wanting to do things. I mean, he, was, he, he wanted to do things the easier way, should that happen. I think that he's a man just like us. He's a human just like us. But we see this appeal to Caesar at this time. It's wisdom on his behalf. Now, an appeal to Caesar was a right that was held by every Roman citizen who faced a capital punishment case. Like, if you had a case that was a big deal that, you know, if if your life was on the line, you could appeal to Caesar. If you thought your trial was not handled correctly, or if you weren't getting a fair shake at innocence, you could appeal and have your case heard before the supreme ruler of the entire empire. This is a big deal. But obviously that came with its own set of consequences because once, the, once, once that appeal <laughs> happened, whatever the emperor said, it was done. There was no more appeal after that. And if you caught him on a bad day, then you were toast, right? So uh, in this case, the emperor was Nero, who was not a friendly person toward Christians. He hated Christians. He enacted all kinds of persecution against Christians later in his rule. He would wrap them in animal skins, drench them in this pitch that was like a tarry substance, and light them on fire so that they could be street lamps in Rome. Terrible, terrible human being. Very hateful, very vile. Then when Festus had conferred with his council in verse 12, He answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. (laughs) So Festus is like, I don't know what to do with this guy. And we're going to see in just a moment, he didn't know what else to do with this case. Like he was at a loss for it, much like Felix was. So he conferred with his fellow Roman law scholars here. They all had a tribunal around them, all the eggheads basically that knew what they were talking about. And uh, they determined that Paul indeed could go to Rome to see Caesar. He met the requirements for that. His case, you know, matched up with how that would have to work. And so he's going to go. But do you see the courage displayed by Paul here? Do you see the courage? He's not just being, you know, he's not, he's not manufacturing this courage. He's not walking in there with his chest stuck out. He's still humble. He's still somebody who's using wisdom. He's still showing Christ-likeness. He was not afraid to take a stand for Jesus because he knew it was the right thing to do. He knew he had a calling to take the gospel forth. So friends, listen, the right thing is not always the easy thing to do. It's very difficult sometimes, but Jesus is always worth it. When it comes to being his witness, his people before unbelievers. So you know, it's unlikely that Paul ever imagined that his journey to Rome would occur this way being arrested, submitting to Roman authorities, being placed in chains. But he was confident that God would fulfill his promise, 
Remember that promise back in 2311. He says, you will stand before the leaders in Rome and testify about me. And Paul knew that that was a big deal. If he could just bring the, the gospel to bear before the leadership of Rome, before the emperor himself, think about that. If you had the opportunity right now in this moment to go before the most powerful leader in the world, the president of the United States, or maybe even think about some of those adversarial people out there, like what if you could go before Vladimir Putin right now? Would you be ready to share the gospel? Paul is like, I'm down. (laughs) Give me a chance to do this. I want to go to Rome. I don't want to go this way, but if this is how it's got to be, then so be it. I trust my Lord to take care of me. So listen, knowing that God is in control and that his gospel will ultimately triumph allows us to be courageous for Christ and trust him. Even in those times of confusion, even in those times of suffering, even in those times of doubt, we can trust that he is in control because he is. So are you willing to be courageous for Christ today? Can you show courage? Are you ready to take the stand he desires for you to take in your life? It might look different for you than it does for other people. It could be a a situation at work. It could be with a family member. It could be with a friend. It could be with a neighbor. It would be naive of us to think that Paul didn't have any um, didn't have any uh, you know doubts here or any confusion. That Paul didn't have any. fear in this predicament. I'm sure he had fear. I'm sure there were times that he despaired. He was human, but he knew that God had called him to make much of Jesus no matter where he was, and he trusted that God was in control, that God was sovereign. So do you trust that today? Do you trust that God, no matter what situation you find yourself in, is in control and has your best interest at heart? He's doing it for your good and his glory. Be confident in that. So we've seen those who are contrary to Christ. We've seen Paul who is courageous for Christ. And then finally, we see those who are confused about Christ. So verses 13 through 22, it starts out, Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa... And Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. Now, who is this person? There's another character for us, right? Agrippa, the king here, was Agrippa II. Now, he was son of Herod Agrippa I, who we see in the gospel accounts. It's who Jesus goes before. And the great-grandson of Herod the Great. You might remember him as the guy that wanted to murder all the babies. And the Christmas account and that story why Jesus had to flee, right? Why Joseph and Mary took Jesus out? It's because of his great-grandfather. It's not a good lineage of people here. But Agrippa II ruled over several minor, primarily Gentile territories, even though he was a Jewish person himself. And the emperor Claudius had given Agrippa II rule over the temple in Jerusalem. He also gave him the right to appoint the high priest. So this guy was a big wig as far as, you know, politicians and, and leaders in this entire region of the world at this time. And Bernice was his sister. And there's a lot of speculation here about what their relationship was like. I don't want to dive down that rabbit hole. But she was constantly with him. Constantly. Some scholars think, well, maybe she had some mental issues and he was her caretaker. Some think that there was, you know, maybe some some form of a romance going on there. Who knows? We don't really know much about that. But we do know that Drusilla from last week is also their little sister and none of them could stand each other. So days of our lives, right? Verse 14, while they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king and he was saying to him, there is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. 
I answer them that that is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accuser stood up, they began bringing charges against him not of such crimes as I was expecting. So you see the confusion here. Verse 19, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. (laughs) Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. And as Ken, I'm sure, will pick up the thread next week. I mean, Festus has no idea what to report to the emperor. He's like, you had to give a detailed report. I mean, paperwork was still a thing back in that day. You had to give a detailed report of why you made this decision to take up the most powerful man in the world's time. And so Festus is like, I don't know what to charge this guy with. Like, there is no charge. He appealed to go to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen, but he's also a Jew. He's like, this is weird, unprecedented. I don't know what to do here. Maybe you, King Agrippa, can give me some ideas, right? That's essentially what's happening here. And then Agrippa is intrigued. He's like, sure, I'll hear this guy out. But do you see the confusion here on Festus's behalf? I mean, you get the sense that he was genuinely perplexed about what to do here. Did you catch verse 19? Did you see the confusion that was there? It was on display. It was just like, you know, this is, this is you know, they're disagreeing about a guy who is dead, but Paul says is alive. I have no idea what they're talking about. That is very much, friends, an outsider's view of what we hold dear. It's an outsider's view of our faith in Jesus. A lot of people say they, they believe in a dude who says, I mean, they say this guy came back to life. Like, you know, a lot of them have no idea what to do to that. And Festus knew he needed to send these papers to Rome describing why. And, uh, and you know, Festus hoped that Agrippa would, would bring some clarity here. But for the most part, he was confused about what all of this meant. So friends, listen, there are many many people who are genuinely confused, genuinely confused about the claims of the gospel. It's not a natural thing for us to wrap our heads around, is it? It's not. To many people, it seems ridiculous, even downright absurd that we believe what we believe. But that doesn't mean that it's not true because it is 1,000% true. Maybe you're here today or you're listening online and you're in confusion. You're in, you're in that confusion camp with Festus, right? Listen, that's fine. It's a natural thing to be confused concerning the claims of Jesus. They go against everything that we are. Where we're sinful and skeptical, Jesus is the embodiment of all that is righteous and true. He himself is righteousness. He himself is truth. And our natural inclination is not to believe him. If we believe scripture, we are children of wrath toward him. We are enemies by default of him because our sin has separated us from him. That's why we needed a savior in the first place. Jesus changed all of that. He takes confusion and turns it into saving faith. He takes your sin and turns it into righteousness, and he can do it for you right now if you would give your life to him. Friends, listen, you don't have to leave here confused about Jesus today. You don't have to remain in confusion. You don't have to have it all figured out before surrendering to him. If you try to take that logic out, you will never come to Jesus because you can't understand it on your own. You will never have full 100% uh, understanding apart from the Holy Spirit 
guiding you and leading you into that truth. So give your life to him and he will bring you understanding. He will bring you meaning. He will bring you freedom. He will bring you all the things that will make your life make sense if you give your heart and life to him today. So to recap, We've seen three dispositions here toward Jesus and his gospel. You can either be contrary, you can be courageous, or you're confused. Which one are you today? If you're contrary to him, if you're still like not on board with believing and you're still mad and you've got problems, please realize that you are standing opposed to the creator and sustainer of all things. That's who you're standing opposed to today. No matter how much you disbelieve, it won't change the fact that he is God and you are separated from him and you must submit to him. And the only way to do that is through Jesus. So give your heart and life to him today. If you're a believer and you don't feel very courageous today, take heart, my friends. Take heart. He is your courage. You don't have to manufacture courage to be courageous You just rest in Jesus. You rest in him today. Rely on the spirit to make you courageous for him in the moment when you have to be. And if you're confused today, don't allow that confusion to hold you back from him. Don't let the enemy trip you up with with things like that. Jesus is alive and stands ready to help your unbelief today. He can do that for you. So turn to him today. Are you contrary? Are you courageous? Or are you confused? Where do you stand today? What is your disposition toward the gospel? As we have a time of response here, if you need to come forward and pray, if you need somebody to pray with you, if you need somebody to walk you through what it means to be a Christian, how that can happen in your life, we will be down front and we can do that. If you just need time in your seat to repent or to give your heart to Jesus or to ask him to to bring this gospel to bear upon your life in whatever season you're in, you can do that there. If you give your heart and life to him today, make that known. So as we have this time of response, submit to Jesus in whatever way that looks like in your life and allow him to, to stand tall in your life today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you give us glimpses and snapshots of people in your word and where they are in life. Lord, you help us to see these things so that you can show us that that we're, we're not much different today. There's still people in this in this world that that genuinely hate you, that are contrary to you and despise your claims. God, we pray for those today who, who are that way. And maybe they're not here today. Maybe they're in a completely different part of the world. God, we see hatred on full display in so many ways toward you. And we pray for those who hate that you would melt their icy hearts with the gospel, that they would see you, Jesus, for who you really are, a savior, a sustainer, a liberator. And God, we pray today for those who are confused about you, who are struggling with what it means to to give their heart and life to you. They're they're considering you, They're, they're trying to make sense of it. God, I pray today that you would just help them to lay their heart and life down to you. Pray that they would see that that you are enough, that you will bring understanding and truth in their life. And for those today who are struggling to be courageous for you, God, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit. Give them, give them courage in their hearts to speak on your behalf, to share your love, to share your word, to share what it is that you have done in their heart and life with others so that that will bring you glory and point more people to you. So God, I just pray wherever people fall today that you would move as only you can. 
bring, bring us faith, bring us hope, bring us encouragement today. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray these things.